Hey, welcome to day 24 of our 40 days together. And today we are going to be reading, oh, I'm Andrea Gibbs. I'm the intern director at Kensington. Um, today we're going to be reading Luke 9 and 10 and then a passage out of the Psalms. So let's jump in. Luke 9. One day, Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Take nothing for your journey, he instructed them. Don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, food, money, or even a change of clothes. Wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. And if a town refuses to welcome you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned these people to their fate. So they began their circuit of the villages, preaching the good news and healing the sick. When Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, heard about everything Jesus was doing, he was puzzled. Some were saying that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. Others thought Jesus was Elijah or one of the other prophets risen from the dead. I beheaded John, Herod said. So who is this man to whom I hear such stories? And he kept trying to see him. When the apostles returned, they told Jesus everything they had done. Then he slipped quietly away with them toward the town of Beth Bethsaida. But the crowds, crowds found out where he was going and they followed him. He welcomed them and taught them about the kingdom of God and he healed those who were sick. Late in the afternoon, the 12 disciples came to him and said, send the crowds away to the nearby villages and farms so they can find food and lodging for the night. There's nothing to eat here in this remote place. But Jesus said, you feed them. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Or were you expecting us to go and buy enough food for this whole crowd? For there were about 5,000 men there. Jesus replied, tell them to sit down in groups of about 50 each. So the people all sat down. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he, he kept giving the bread and fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. One day, Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do people say I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say that you are one of the other ancient prophets risen from the dead. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah sent from God. Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone who he was. The Son of Man must suffer many terrible things, he said. He will be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. Then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost or destroyed? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God. About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see. And they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. When they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. And Moses and Elijah were starting to leave. Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let us make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them, and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell anyone at that time what they had seen. The next day, after they had come down from the mountain, a large crowd, a large crowd met Jesus. A man in the crowd called out to him, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, my only child. An evil spirit keeps seizing him, making him scream. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It batters him and hardly ever leaves him alone. I begged your disciples to cast out the spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said, You faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you and put up with you? Then he said to the man, Bring your son here. 
As the boy came forward, the demon knocked him to the ground and threw him into a violent convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit and healed the boy. When he gave him back to his father, awe gripped the people as they saw this majestic display of God's power. While everyone was marveling at everything Jesus was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Listen to me and remember what I say. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. But they didn't know what he, was meant, what he meant. Its significance was hidden from them, so they couldn't understand it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. Then his disciples began arguing about which one of them was the greatest. But Jesus knew their thoughts, so he brought a little child to his side. Then he said to them, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me also welcomes my Father who sent me. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. John said to Jesus, Master, we saw someone using your name to cast out demons, but we told him to stop because he isn't in our group. But Jesus said, don't stop him. Anyone who is not against you is for you. As the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival, but the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. So they went on to another village. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay even his head. He said to another person, come, follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus said to him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop and greet anyone on the road. Whenever you enter someone's house, first say, may God's peace be on this house. And if those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they are not, the blessing will return to you. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve their pay. If you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. But if a town refuses to welcome you, go out into the streets and say, we wipe even the dust of your town from our feet to show that we have abandoned you to your fate. And know this, the kingdom of God is near. I assure you, even wicked Sodom will be better off than better off than such a town on Judgment Day. What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, they, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. Yes, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. And you people of Capernaum, Will you be honored in heaven? No, you'll go down to the place of the dead. Then he said to the disciples, anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. And anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. At that time, Jesus was filled with joy of the Holy Spirit, and he said, Oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the children, the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then when they were alone, he turned to his disciples and said, Blessed are the eyes that see what you have seen. I tell you, many prophets and kings long to see what you see, but they didn't see it. 
and they longed to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead by the road. By chance, a priest came along, but he saw the man lying there. He crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion on him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who, atta who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. The only one thing worth being, there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mar Mary has discovered it and it will be not taken away from her. Um, wow, that was a lot. A lot of stories, a lot of things happening. Um, they asked us when we do our, these readings to kind of share a little bit at the end. And I was, you know, getting this thing together where I wanted to talk to you all about how these two chapters are starting to point towards the death of Christ and how his deity is coming out in all of these chapters. You've got the transfiguration and miracles and all kinds of stuff happening. But um, I decided not to. So you'll have to figure all that out on your own. What I want to talk about really quickly is just a time in my life where this passage, one of a section of this passage, hit me hard and was really, really powerful in my life. And it's um, the passage in chapter 9, verses 10 through 17, where Jesus is feeding the 5,000. Um, I think about this passage a lot, to be honest with you, because about 20 years ago, I, I have four kids, and so at that time, they were fourth grade, second grade, and then two preschoolers. And my husband traveled, he was a consultant at that time, and he was gone, some days he was gone 28 days out of the month. So I was basically a single mom, and I was feeling pretty helpless. I was feeling like, I, I can't do this. I can't take care of these kids and raise them to love Jesus and, and do this all by myself, it's too much. And one night I sat down to read, and I happened to be on this passage. I was reading through Luke at a much slower pace than we're doing in these 40 days. And I um, got to this passage where the disciples basically are bringing their problem to Jesus. Because they say to him, um, later in the afternoon, the disciples say to him, Send the crowds away to a nearby village and farm so they can find food and lodging for the night. There's nothing to eat here in this remote place. And what hit me when I was reading this was 20 years ago was, man, the disciples had, an, had, they had issues too. This one, you know, was a big one, but mine is right now happens to be that I just feel like an inferior parent. Jesus said to them, you feed them. And what hit me that 20 years ago was, it was as if Jesus was saying to me, no, you, you can do this. I, I'm not going to make this, make your kids go magically go away or, or turn you into a wonderful parent. You, you do it. And then the disciples said to Jesus, but we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, or are you expecting us to go and buy enough food for the whole crowd? And that's kind of my response to Jesus at that point was, Jesus, all I got is me. 
five loaves and two fish. I've got me. I've got these kids and you're telling me to raise them and take care of the problem and all I got is me. Um, and I love Jesus' response. In fact, I'm going to cheat a little bit here because we also read this passage back, the, the same story, if you remember, is in Matthew and Mark. But in Matthew, after the, the, the disciples say, but we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, what's Jesus' response? He says, bring them here. Then he told the people to sit down in the grass. And the story goes on in all three, in all three versions. Um, bring them to me. And Jesus wasn't saying bring the people to me. He was saying bring the fish to me. Bring, bring what you have. Bring what little you have to me and watch what I'm going to do with it. And oh my gosh, I was... I think I wept that night sitting sitting in my chair reading this passage because I felt like Jesus was saying, yeah, you, you are insufficient. Clearly you don't have enough in yourself to raise these kids and do this job I've given you. Bring yourself to me and watch what I do with you. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's been a lot of what I've thought about through the years when I Anytime I come across this passage, I remember that because now fast forward all these years and my kids are grown and out of the house. Um, my youngest is almost 20, so I almost don't even have teenagers anymore. Um, and I can't even, I don't have time in this, in this time here together to tell you all the ways that God took the little, little bit that I had to offer him and turned it into more than enough. Um, yeah. So I'll leave you with that. Um, let me close by reading the psalm for the day, which is Psalm 24. And I'm going to kind of use it as just our, our closing prayer. So let me read it to you. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it, up, and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. By the way, can I pause here for a second? Now, the, this passage was written a thousand years before Jesus walked the earth. And who is it now? How is it now that we have a right relationship with God? It's, we can't, we can't be people who don't worship idols and never tell lies. Jesus was the one who did that. This is, this passage is pointing to Jesus and how our faith in him is what makes us have a right, right relationship with God. Just had to add that. Okay, it goes on. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of, heaven, of heaven's armies. He is the king of glory. <sighs> Jesus, we just want to come before you. You are the king of glory. And you take what little bit we have to offer you and you turn it into more than enough for what you want accomplished through us. You do it. You do it in us and through us. So we just want to pause in that today. We want to thank you for who you are. We want to rest in you. And again, as I'm sure many have prayed before in these 40 days together, we pray for unity, Lord. We pray that we would all be, um, even if we're not on the same page, I pray that we love each other and come together and unite around you, the King of Glory. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Have a great day.